Dear Federal Chancellor Olaf Scholz, we last met in May here, around three months after the onset of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Apart from immeasurable suffering for the Ukrainian people, the war has also had drastic consequences for the rest of Europe. Energy prices skyrocketed, inflation made a comeback, and energy security is the order of the day. In order to defend Europe's independence and security, Germany, under your leadership, Mr. Chancellor, initiated a Zeitenwende with consequences for foreign and security policy and also with the promise of a massive acceleration of the transition to renewable energy sources. This is why we are particularly looking forward to your participation this year and hearing from you once again. Welcome, Chancellor. Professor Schwab, dear Klaus, ladies and gentlemen, what a difference a year makes. When I spoke to you last year around this time, our discussions revolved around the global economy's path out of the pandemic. At the start of 2022, many people were expecting a boom, or at least a substantial boost for our economy's transition toward climate neutrality. Then came February 24. Since then, Russia has been waging an imperialist war of aggression here on our doorstep in Europe. With dreadful consequences that Ukrainians are bearing more than anyone. Just today, the Secretary of the Interior and 15 others, other victims, were killed in a tragic helicopter crash. We are with their families. But the war is also having an impact on all of us. For a while, energy prices jumped to levels higher than we had ever seen before. Around the world, production costs and consumer prices exploded. Many people fear that coal and oil will make a lasting comeback all across the world. If that were to happen, the 1.5 degree target would become meaningless. Our supply chains must be adopted to new geopolitical realities. Realities that you called a messy patchwork of powers in your speech yesterday, Klaus. And over all of this hangs a sword of Damocles, the danger of a new fragmentation of the world of deglobalization and decoupling. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, this is just one part of the story of last year, just one part of the reality that we are looking at here in Davos. The other part of the story is this. Russia has already failed completely in reaching its imperialist goals. Ukraine is defending itself with great success and impressive courage. A broad international alliance led by the G7, is providing the country with financial, economic, humanitarian and military support. Germany alone made available over 12 billion euro last year, and we will continue to support Ukraine for as long as necessary. In Berlin, in Berlin at the end of October, we worked with international experts to draw up a Marshall Plan for the long-term reconstruction of Ukraine. A platform of major donors is coordinating the process and, in consultation with Ukraine, ensuring that it is well implemented. Private sector capital will play a key role here. I know that many companies in Germany and beyond are very aware of the opportunities that the Ukrainian economic miracle could offer to them. 
particularly as the country moves toward the European Union after the end of the war. But in order for the war to end, Russia's aggression must fail. That is why we are continuously supplying Ukraine with large quantities of arms in close consultation with our partners. This includes air defense systems like IRIS-T or Patriot, artillery and armored infantry fighting vehicles marking a profound turning point in German foreign and security policy. And there's another part to the story of last year. Within a few months, Germany made itself completely independent from Russian gas, Russian oil, and Russian coal. We concluded new partnerships in Asia, Africa, and America, thus lessening our dependence. And so I can say that our energy supply for this winter is secure. Thanks to well-filled storage facilities, thanks to improved energy efficiency, thanks to remarkable solidarity within Europe, and thanks to the readiness of our companies and of millions of citizens to save energy. As a result, energy prices have recently seen a huge stop and drop. Our measures to reduce the burden on private citizens, companies and businesses are working. Inflation is falling slowly, thanks incidentally also to resolute moves by the central banks. Industrial production, production in Germany has remained stable over the past few months against all the odds. Our employment rate is at record levels and has recently increased even further. Most importantly, our transformation toward a climate-neutral economy, the fundamental task of our century, is currently taking on an entirely new dynamic. Not in spite of, but because of the Russian war and the resulting pressure on us Europeans to change. Whether you are a business leader or a climate activist, a secu security policy specialist or an investor, it is now crystal clear to each and every one of us that the future belongs solely to renewables. For cost reasons, for environmental reasons, for security reasons, and because in the long run, renewables promise the best returns. So yes, the past year brought fundamental change for Germany and Europe. But Germany itself has fundamentally changed as well. We are resolutely pushing forward with the decarbonization of our industry. We want to be climate neutral by 2045, and at the same time we will remain a country with a strong manufacturing sector. And despite all the difficulties this past year showed us, we can and we will succeed in that. In less than seven months, we built up an entirely new import infrastructure for LNG in Wilhelmshaven. In the future, it can also be used for hydrogen. Just last Saturday, I opened our second LNG terminal within just a few weeks in Lubmin. The day after tomorrow, another terminal ship is expected to arrive at the port of Brunsbüttel. More will follow. This is not only good news for our energy security and that of our European neighbors who will be receiving gas from these terminals. Above all, it shows Germany can be flexible, we can be unbureaucratic, and we can be fast. I spoke of a new Deutschlandgeschwindigkeit in this regard, a new German speed. We will make this German speed the benchmark also for the transformation of the economy as a whole. Your companies can hold on us to this standard. A new law mandates that the expansion of wind power, solar energy, as well as electricity and hydrogen networks now take priority. We will make available no less than 2% of our country for wind power with a minimum of red tape. We have streamlined our processes so that approvals for electricity grids, to name just one example, 
are granted on average two years faster than before. And we intend to step up the pace even more. You can also rely on our targets. The obstacles have been swept aside. For 2023, we have more than doubled the volume of calls for tender for onshore wind farms alone. By the year 2030, 80% of our electricity production will come from renewable sources, again, double what it is at present. At the same time, our electricity requirements are increasing from 600 terawatt hours today to 750 by the end of the decade. And we are expecting them to double yet again in the 2030s. This is a massive increase. That is why the Federal Network Agency has been given a clear mandate to prepare and expand our electricity grids accordingly. We will regularly review the progress made. If it's not on schedule, the measures will be adjusted. However, electricity alone is not enough to run Germany's industry. I'm thinking, for instance, of steel production. Hydrogen will play a decisive role there. And that is not a far-off scenario. Last fall, ThyssenKrupp gave the green light to build a direct reduction plant for low-carbon premium steel. With a capacity of 2.5 million metric tons, the plant will save 3.5 million metric tons of CO2 per year. This is just one example of Europe's strength in innovation. Europe is the world's number one in hydrogen patents, and one in ten global applications comes from Germany. The first supply chains for green hydrogen are currently being built up in our country. For our own production, we are using offshore wind in the North Sea. In parallel, we are concluding hydrogen partnerships worldwide. For as long as quantities are small and the costs of production correspondingly high, the state will bring prices down to a level lucrative for the industry. Our goal is nothing less than an electrolysis boom. And as quantities increase, a hydrogen-powered industrial sector will emerge that preserves the climate and is independent of volatile prices for fossil fuels. Because one thing is absolutely certain. Energy must remain affordable in Germany, in Europe and worldwide. In Germany, we decided to cap electricity and gas prices for private citizens and companies. These measures will run until 2024. Annually, we will use around 2.2% of our GDP for this, a total of up to 200 billion euro. That is both forceful and proportionate. It will give your companies the reliable energy prices and the plan planning certainty you need to invest in Germany's transformation. In the European Union, we have agreed on joint targets for gas filling and saving. We will purchase gas jointly more often and coordinate storage better. And we will use our market power to ensure that European prices do not decouple completely from the world market. Moreover, we are also aware of our global responsibility. Let me say this expressly, expressly to our friends and partners in Asia, Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean. The fact that we Europeans purchase LNG on the world market must not lead to scarcity elsewhere. We will need alternatives for the roughly 100 billion, 120 billion cubic meters of gas from Russian pipelines missing from the world market. More renewables, of course, but also temporarily additional gas resources. Otherwise, there is a danger that without affordable gas, emerging economies in particular might switch back to coal. This would be even more harmful to the environment. Of course, we must avoid new lock-ins, new path dependencies at all costs by making new projects HO2 ready from the very outset and being 
and by expanding renewables in parallel. In the short term, this may lead to higher costs. How longer in the long term we all stand to save if the impact of climate change is less dramatic. In Germany too, switching to a climate-friendly economy will take efforts. We are talking about investments around 400 billion euro for the expansion of renewables between now and 2030. Investments, by the way, which, in, which are already well underway. The most recent example is a contract worth billions for Siemens Energy to connect a new offshore wind park to the grid. And this is just one example illustrating why this turning point towards a climate-friendly industry is not the end of our industrial powerhouse, but a new start. After all, even before the energy crisis that Russia triggered, Germany's business model was not only based on the energy-intensive mass production of aluminium, cement or crude steel, but on highly specialized research and technology-intensive industrial products, products that are needed all around the world. All the more so, actually, when the world is now transitioning towards a climate-neutral future. Even before Russia's war of aggression, Germany's energy prices were not the lowest. And yet Germany was and remains competitive. This is because of thousands of small and medium-sized enterprises all across the country. Enterprises that are highly innovative and adaptable, which explains why they are so often global leaders. This is thanks to high public and private investment in research and development, which, for example, ensured that the first COVID-19 test and the first safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine were developed in Germany. Just in December, a team at the Helmut Center in Berlin set a new world record for the efficiency of solar cells. And now, just a few weeks later, our companies are already setting up pilot lines for the use of these tandem cells. That, ladies and gentlemen, is and remains the German business model, particularly now as we chart our path to a climate-neutral future. Why else is there such broad consensus between businesses, employees and politics that the path to climate neutrality is not just ecologically necessary, but also offers new opportunities in global competition? When it comes to basic and professional training for employees, for example, politics, business and trade unions in Germany are working hand in hand. And before the year is out, our country will finally benefit from modern immigration legislation. After all, if we want to remain competitive as a leading industrial nation, we need experienced practitioners, qualified engineers, tradesmen and mechanics. Those who want to roll up their sleeves are welcome in Germany. That is our message. For decades now, the forecasts have been predicting a shrinking German population. But it is up to us to decide whether this happens. So far, it certainly hasn't. Today, Germany has more inhabitants and employed persons than ever before. And this is precisely the trend we are going to continue. Ladies and gentlemen, a climate-neutral future is, needless to say, not something any single country can achieve on its own. That is why our dialogue and, our, and a forum like Davos are so crucial. What we are doing in Germany also serves the goal of making Europe the first climate-neutral continent by 2050. At the European level, we are going to lower our net greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030 compared to 1990. This decision stands. Here, we are relying on the market, on competition and on innovation. The EU's emission trading system is a case in point. Even today, we are using it to cut permissible emission levels in a way that is predictable for all. 
At the same time, this system is serving as a catalyst for innovation. But to ensure the most ambitious are not disadvantaged, we prepare ground to carbon border adjustment mechanism in Europe. At the same time, however, Europe remains open for international trade. I'm doing my utmost to ensure that the free trade agreements we have successfully negotiated with Canada, Korea, Japan, New Zealand and Chile will soon be followed by new ones with Mercosur, India and Indonesia. And we are also open to discuss a tariff agreement for the industrial sector with the United States. Though these agreements, we are creating a level playing field and we are preventing high emission industries from heading off to countries with less ambitious climate targets. This is also the aim of the International Climate Club we launched during Germany's G7 presidency. A secretariat has recently been set up at the OECD and the International Energy Agency. So the club is now open to new ambitious members. In the United States, this ambition has a name the Inflation Reduction Act. Some $370 billion have been earmarked for energy and climate change mitigation over the next 10 years. I very much welcome this investment. Through the German Climate and Transformation Fund, we have made almost 180 billion euro available ourselves for the period of 2023 to 2026. But local content requirements for certain products must not result in discrimination against European businesses. Protectionism hinders competition and innovation and is detrimental to climate change mitigation. We, as EU members, are talking to our American friends about this. And at the same time, we are looking at what we ourselves can do to further improve investment conditions here in Europe. The CHIPS Act, for instance, has brought about a new start for chip manufacturing in Europe. Investors are starting new production plants for billions of euros. They can build on an existing semiconductor industry. This could become a model for other key technologies, particularly in the digital and climate sectors. And the funding is there for the taking. To date, only 20% of the, of the more than 700 billion euro in the European Recovery Fund has been paid out. Its full impact will thus emerge over the coming years. To remain competitive, we will have to make European legislation on state aid more agile and flexible, just as European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has proposed and reaffirmed here yesterday. So, that investors know in advance what support to expect and don't have to wait until years after their investment to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, the past year challenged us as seldom before. Yet, at the same time, we changed and moved things forward as seldom before. Germany itself is changing. If I may make a prediction, my successor will address you at the World Economic Forum in 2045. Sure. He or she will present Germany as one of the world's first climate-neutral industrial nations. Energy supplies in Germany and Europe will then be sourced almost exclusively from green electricity, heat and hydrogen. We will be moving emission-free on our roads and railroads. Our buildings will be energy efficient. Our businesses will be producing on a climate neutral basis. And what is more, they are the ones who will have driven this transitions, transition who will continue to drive it. So if you ask me today where you can invest in the future sustainably with a high return, my answer is don't look any further. Come to us, to Germany and to Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. We have 
Some questions uh, from the floor. Uh, we have a microphone. Um, I just want to say I, I look forward to chair uh, the session with your successor. <laughs> and, and, I'm sure you will. <laughs> and, no, um, Chancellor, maybe until it's set up, you mentioned the patchwork of powers. But maybe one of the, the first questions would be, uh, how is Germany positioning itself in this patchwork of powers? First, I think we will live in a multipolar world in the 10, 20, 30 years, we already do, but this will be something we will understand much more in the years to come. And I'm sure that there will be not a bipolar world again with camps around two big nations or so. But the big task of all of us is that we make it feasible that this will be not a world with a lot of different strong powers, but also a world where cooperation is the reality, and this is why we have to work to make it multilateral, which I think is something about politics. And hopefully we started this year to make this happen. When I had the chance to preside G7, I invited democracies, Indonesia, India, South Africa, the head of the African Union, Senegal, the head of the uh, the speaker of the Latin American and Caribbean nations, uh, Argentina, to the G7 meeting in Elmau in Germany. And this was, a, was intended to start on a dialogue on, on the same level, on, on understanding that they will be relevant and very important nations, and more to come to, to join them in the world and that we cooperate. And the place of Germany in this world is being supporting these processes, working very hard to make this uh, good cooperation between nations from Asia, Africa, South of America, and uh, West of Europe, and North America, and others working. But uh, also understanding that this will only work if we do it as part of the European Union, that the strong and uh, geopolitical sovereign European Union will be one of the important actors in this world. Thank you. Let's see. Let's collect maybe two or three questions. Uh, someone with a microphone? And if I you introduce yourself, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Masih Ali Nejad. I'm an Iranian woman. As you know, these days, Iranian women are getting killed in the street just because of peacefully protesting and asking for dignity, democracy, and freedom. Um, revolutionary guards are killing innocent people in the street. I, myself, I'm, I was a target of revolutionary guards. In the United States of America, the FBI charged four people who were trying to kidnap me. The revolutionary guards sent drones to, Ukraine, to Putin to kill innocent Ukrainians. Why Germany doesn't designate the Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization? Because you just called American friends. American government did that three years ago. Thank you. Let's Thank take you. a second, one third question. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Aya Khirfan. I'm uh, from the Global Shapers community representing uh, Amman Hub in Jordan. Uh, thank you so much. It's a very inspiring speech, actually, to hear about uh, Germans' role in energy transition and energy efficiency. Um, in Jordan, we have, like, energy is a low-hanging fruit. There's a great potential. Um, we have basically signed the National Determined Contributions, the NDCs. We have produced national energy action plans. Answer uh, question, please. Yes. <laughs> so we want to talk about the role of youth. Um, what kind of skills do you think are needed for uh, youth to have today so that they can be able to run and be leaders in the energy sector. Um, thank you. Chancellor, we take a third question, maybe, and send it. Thank you. Uh, Peter Zalmay of Ukraine. Uh, 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 Mr. Chancellor, thank you so much uh, for your country's contribution to the effort of Ukrainians to defend their country. Uh, it seems that uh, it's only a matter of time that Ukraine must get 
the heavy tanks, including the Leopards, that are absolutely necessary for Ukraine to successfully defend its territory. Uh, we were expecting to, uh, today to hear you finally decide on this. It seems that Germany's uh, Western allies, the U.S. and other countries, are ready to step up, and it's only German hesitancy that has prevented it. So my question to you is, why hesitate and why wait? Thank you. Mr. Chancellor, do you want to... Yeah, thank you for the three questions, and I would like to answer to them. Um, first, uh, we very much support the people of, uh, of Iran in their, in their activities and fight for democracy, especially the women, but all the others, and especially the young people doing so. And to be very clear, I think it is uh, very necessary for all of us to understand that uh, the Iranian government is really shooting its own people. And this is the reality. And this is also why we are very strong in what we say and what we are doing together with our friends in the European Union, where we are very coordinated to act, and with all our other allies where we are working to deal this question, also aside of the European Union, for instance, the UK or the United States. And uh, because of that, we are very strict and we decided on new sanctions that we, as we did in the past, and uh, the decisions are the ones we speak together with others and new sanctions have been established uh, shortly uh, and we will continue to look at the situation and to do the next decisions necessary. And as in this way, it is necessary that we are always acting together, looking at the situation and what we decided and decide will be together with especially the Europeans. On the question of, uh, of the skills needed for, for this uh, turn to renewables and uh, the turn to, to become climate friendly, if I got it right, in, in the different countries and especially yours, for instance, I think the question is, is really important because if we want to make it up to the midst of the century, it is not a long time since then. If we look at 2050 or in Germany to 2045, and we want to become uh, climate neutral, we want to produce CO2 neutral, this means the biggest industrial modernization and uh, process we ever had since possibly nearly the beginning of the industrialization 200 years ago. Possibly we can compare it to the uprise of industrialization, industrialization in some countries in Europe in the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century. So this is a really big task for the whole world. And so we have to develop the technologies, we have to do the necessary innovations to make this happen, and we have to invest billions, billions, billions that this is uh, making, that this progress is really happening. And this will be not just linked to one country or the other. Germany can serve in a way that we are willing to do it, that we are ready to do it, that our industry is doing, willing to do it, and whilst we are acting in this way, we are able to develop technologies that can be used not just for us, but also as cheap alternatives for, to fossil resources and fossil uh, mechanisms uh, we know today. And in this case, I think it's important that uh, we support countries and the development of, uh, of vocational training, for instance, to be good uh, engineers in, in the, the field of uh, these modern technologies and uh, also to, to help those who want to learn these tech uh, qualifications at universities. And this is our understanding what one can do and in our support to other countries this will be an important aspect. Looking to Ukraine, as I mentioned already in my speech and I will repeat it again, Germany is between the biggest uh, supporters. Yes, the United States are doing the most, and this is not uh, really surprising because I think they invest $800 billion into their defense budget. This is much more as all the European member states uh, uh, together, and there's even more than Germany is having as uh, its own budget, though we are increasing it now to 2% of our GDP, and though we have a special fund of $100 billion to go to this path and invest in new technologies and weapons. But we decided very early to change our political strategies. We are not just supporting Ukraine with financial means, with humanitarian aid, but also 
with uh, a lot of weapons. And if we look at that, we are between the ones that are doing the most. The United States are the number one, obviously, because of this, what I said, but the next are the United Kingdom and Germany. And uh, we will continue to be this big supporter. As you know, we decided that we will supply not just weapons, but those who are very effective. And uh, the artillery coming from Germany with our howitzer and uh, called Panzerhaubitze 2000 and uh, the multi-rocket launcher we delivered are very effective in this war, helping the Ukraine to defend its integrity and sovereignty. And uh, you should, or you realized, that it's only the United States, UK and Germany that uh, delivered a multi-rocket launcher so far. And we will continue to do so. We delivered a lot of weapons which are very important to defend, uh, the, to, to, to the air defense of, of the Ukraine. It's uh, the flag tank Gepard and the munition necessary for that, and we continue to do that. It's smaller weapons, but it's also the very famous IRST system from Germany, which is uh, having a nearly 100% effectiveness in, in getting down missiles uh, sent by Russia to destroy Russian, uh, to destroy Ukrainian houses, uh, streets, uh, railroads, and uh, energy, uh, energy production sites. And uh, we will continue to this. I think many people thought this is possibly the best to get, and we will increase the production with our industry to deliver more of that. And uh, most recently, we decided together with the United States, and we're very much uh, aligned with our French friends, that uh, we will deliver um, similar weapons, which, as I already mentioned, the Bradley from the United States and the Marder from Germany. And this is the strategy we have, that we are um, strategically interlocked together with our friends and partners, that we are working together with them, that we are discussing with them, and that we are never doing something just by ourselves, but together with others, especially the United States, which are very important in this common task to defend the Ukrainian independence and sovereignty. As I said in my speech, we will continue to do this as long as necessary. And uh, whilst we are doing this and showing uh, that uh, the Ukrainians can rely on our support for their courageous fight, it is also clear that we will avoid that this is becoming a war between Russia and NATO. I think this is something which is also the view of the Ukrainians, as far as I understand with all my talks, and we will continue to be active in this way to do this. My willingness, the willingness of Germany, the willingness of the European Union and all the supporters of the Ukrainian nation is that they will be able to become an independent, free, democratic nation which will go the way to the European Union and will join it. And this is what we do. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. This concludes our session. Um, please join me in expressing our appreciation for your speech and we, we look forward to seeing you with success stories soon again. And you will meet someone in 2045. Uh, I hope to see you also in 2045.